think that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> okay, so yes, yeah, so my back is, is better, but I'm still twinging. So I'm going to sit most of the time. If I stand for very long, um, it starts to hurt. I, we have lots I want to talk about, and this is just a boatload of reading, and I get it. Like Herodotus is huge, and but if we spread it out, it just wouldn't, do you know what I mean? Big chunks help you follow it better. If you just read little bits and then you went back the next week and read a little tiny bit, like you'd have to review all the bit you read before. Um, so stick with me. Um, if it makes you feel good, after we finish Herodotus, we are reading some plays. And the plays are really short. Now, I have a couple of weeks when I'm having you read more than one play, but never more than two plays. And honestly, I can read these in one sitting. Like you get, you get your tea and you sit down for a couple of hours and you read the play because there's no place to stop. Do you know what I mean? It's not like Shakespeare plays where there's act one, act two, act three. It's just boom. It just goes all the way through. And so you will have a, a, reading, marathon. a reading marathon and then a reading relaxation. All right, a little bit. Um, I wanted to uh, open, your, um, open your reading guides to page 33. Because I, won, I meant to do this last week, and I lost track of time, and I was 23. 33. Um, I wanted to go over this outline with you. Some of these people you met in your Herodotus reading. Um, but I told you, a couple weeks ago, we did that outline about the Archaic Age in Greece. And I told you that um, one of the things that happened during the Archaic Age was uh, moving around and um, uh, colonizing. Asia Minor and the toe and the boot of Italy and North Africa and all the way to Spain and, and southern France. Uh, but the other thing that happened during that period was developing these city-states in Greece to be what they were going to be, what this idea we have of them. So Sparta becoming a military state and the lawgivers that came and set that up and Athens becoming a democracy and the lawgivers that came. So this is this outline today I want to go over. This is sort of a zoom in on what happened in Athens. Okay. And it mentions Pisistratus and Solon, both of whom you met in Herodotus. And I want to take a look at that. Um, the first written laws that Athens had were written by a man named Draco. And Draco had the death penalty for everything. No. Um, although just as mean, it yeah. sounds like, or possibly even meaner. Um, because if you, if you steal a loaf of bread, death penalty. If you murder someone, death penalty. And they say that somebody came to Draco once and said, Draco, why should these two things get the same penalty? And he said, if you steal a loaf of bread, you deserve to die. If you murder someone, you deserve worse than that, but I can't think of anything worse to do to you. Nice. So, Draco, this is not a maintainable system, if you know what I mean. Like, people are not going to put up with that forever. All right, people are going to rebel. Eventually, Athens, as places, as governments often do, it degenerated into a rule of the aristocracy, right? Because they had control of the law courts. They have the money to get things done. You know, and even like today, it costs money to get elected. We say anybody could be elected president, but you gotta have a boatload of money or a lot of backers to get elected president, right? Um, so here's the situation. The upper class owns the best land. They control the council that makes the laws. Only they can be in this council, the Areopagus, which met at a place also called the Areopagus, which is a rocky hill just right by the Acropolis. Um, it, in the New Testament, in Acts, they translate it Mars Hill because Pegus means hill and Areo means Aries, right? It's the hill of Aries, it's Mars Hill. Um, and when rich people are in charge and the poor people don't have any say, the poor people get angry, right? And eventually they say, we're, we're angry and we're not going to take it anymore. 
So this is what it looked like in Athens. So they went to a man named Solon. And we, we, I'm going to mention Solon again when we get into Herodotus. Hopefully you remember the famous story about Solon. If you don't, we're going to do it again today, and you'll remember. Um, th he was from the aristocratic party, but he was liked by everybody because he was just a good guy. And they said, would you fix this for us? We need to fix our laws. First of all, he cancels all debt. Now, unfortunately, Hannah owes Karsten a good deal of money. How does Hannah feel about canceling debt? How does Karsten feel about canceling debt? I am not happy. I'm never going to get a dime out of Hannah. OK, so we can't please everybody, right, when you change the rules. Um, people had been enslaved for debt. Like, you could sell somebody. You can sell her. <laughs> she doesn't pay you back. You can sell her and get the proceeds. Solon set them all free. Yeah, Gabby. He could do quite a bit to get back at her, presumably, if he's that sort of person, which Karsten would never, ever do. Um, then he divided everybody into four groups. Now, these four groups are still based on your money. But instead of just rich and poor, we're going to have four groups. Groups number one and two, they can be in that council in the Areopagus. They can decide which laws should be considered. All right, so top two class. Third class gets a council to like set the agenda for the Areopagus. Like we're going to, we're just the third class of, of people. We're not. You know, we're not very up there aristocratically or financially, but we all get to join a council and we're going to sit around and say, I think the Areopagus should think about this law or that. Let's pass that on to the Areopagus and see what they think of that. Okay. So in other words, I feel like I have a say. Uh, yeah. And then the fourth class is still allowed a vote in every assembly. Everybody gets a vote. You're poor. This is Athens. You get a vote. You're rich. You get a vote. However, not everybody's happy. Karsten is unhappy. And you know what? Hannah is not completely happy. Hannah, it was a big relief to Hannah to not have to pay Karsten. But guess what? You're still poor, Hannah. I'm sorry. You're still poor. Solon's not giving you anything. You are still poor. And Karsten is still rich. And you get a vote. But your life still stinks. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to report this. Um, also, um, something else uh, happened, and it is this. So this is nice because we have three tables. All right. So you're all Athenian citizens. Congratulations. All right. All right. However, now remember, Athens was not just the town of Athens. Athens is the surrounding countryside, like the farms. Those people are Athenians too. And they only live a couple of miles outside of town. So whenever we have a vote, they can just stroll into town and vote and stroll back to their farm. It's not like it's a long distance, OK? But these, this table, they live in the mountains. Congratulations. You guys live by the seashore. You guys live in the city, OK? Now, I want you to think about this. Do all three tables have all exactly the same concerns, like legal concerns, life concerns? No. You guys, mountain goat invasion. Like, it's serious. The mountain goat problem in the, I don't even know if there are mountain goats in Greece. But get, you, you are dealing with, you know, uh, avalanches, all right, avalanche and goats. And this is on your agenda. Like, I think we should have more laws concerning mountain goats and avalanches. You guys are by the shore. You know, you don't like the tides. They wreck all your sand cap. I'm being very silly. But, you know, maybe shipping, maybe harbors. Like, we would like to develop a harbor where we live, and it would be income for us, you know, if, if ships were coming in. You guys in the city, like, I don't know what they're all on about, about the beach and the mountain goats, but there are no mountain goats in the town, and we're totally fine. And I'm really concerned about the sewage system. 
Because people, you know, like they use a chamber pot or whatever, they just dump it in the street, and it's gross. Like, we need to do something about that. So you, do you see how we've got factions now? So we all meet in the council, and guess what? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, I'm sorry, you mountain people? Nothing's happening with the goats and the avalanches. You will never be able to carry any motion because you don't have enough people that care. You see the problem? I'm sorry. These guys are going to get into it a little bit, but does that make sense? I am simplifying dramatically. That's, that's close enough. All right, this is what's going on. So, right, yes, yes. So the city carries the day. So this is what was going on. It also meant that we had voting blocks, you know, factions. And if somebody wanted to take charge, they could just win over. If they could win over, and there were actually four groups, there weren't three, like there were, it was a farm group or something too, but that was roughly the way it was, okay? It was geographical, you know, interests. And you could win over, if you could win over two of the factions, you could trounce the other two, and you could take over. And this is what a man named Pisistratus did. You read about Pisistratus, and we're, I'm going to highlight that in our, in our reading when we go back through. There's no way. Look at all the blue flags I put. Like, we're going to talk about every single one of these flags. I don't think so, but this was all, as I was reading, I'm like, we should talk about that. We should talk about that. That's not going to happen. But Pisistratus, we should. Pisistratus won over enough people from two of the factions to take over and become what the Greeks call a tyrant. Now, what do you guys think of when I say tyrant? A, um, in a usually aggressive, um, what's the word? He um, kind of pounds out resistance. He's um, he oppressive, oppressive, suppressive. OK, oppressive, yes. Yeah. Okay, that is exactly what we think of. That's how we use the word tyrant. That's how we use it, like tyrant, the tyrant lizard. But here's what, it, here's what we need to remember. It didn't mean that to the Greeks. It only meant a ruler who takes over through non-legitimate means, all right? It doesn't really mean he did a bad job, and it doesn't actually mean he was mean to anybody. Pisistratus was actually a pretty reasonable ruler but he wasn't, he made himself ruler. I, I'm not going to tell you how because I want to look at that in Herodotus. He was good, but his sons were jerks. And, you know, when, when your sons are jerks and you leave it to your sons, that never goes well, right? So finally, um, we're getting into, like, even after the time of Herodotus, all right, that Herodotus is writing about. We had a final Athenian lawmaker named Cleisthenes. And we're going to meet Cleisthenes later in Herodotus. Cleisthenes had a brainstorm. You know these tables? We're going to divide all Athenians into 10 tribes instead of these groups. And guess what? Alex and Gabby and Carl are all going to be in the same tribe. And Karsten and Kyle and Aloran are all going to be in the same tribe. So I'm mixing it up. So every tribe has people from all different areas, and they mix up the things that are important to them. All right. Um, 50 people from each of these tribes gets to be on a council of 500 that decides what laws should get voted on. Get this. The council was elected by law. You know what? Almost every position in Athens was elected by lot. Can you imagine if we just put names in a hat and we drew them out and whoever, you know, whoever, whoever got drawn out, whoever got the green rock or whatever gets to be president? Yeah. Whether you're an idiot or not, we don't care. You, congratulations, you're a council member. They voted, they voted on the laws, but for holding office, their idea was that everybody who had a decent education and upbringing in Athens 
ought to be as good as any other person in, in politics. You ought to care as much as everyone else, and you ought to be as good as anyone else. I, I have nothing to say about that. I think there's might be problematic, but because we have different intelligence levels. But yeah, Ethan. It is risky. Oh yeah, yeah, it's risky. Well, I think may, we might get some, some insight. Um, so I'm reading a bunch about Rome right now because I'm making one of these for Rome for next year. All right, I'm, I'm just reading. So I've been spending a lot of time with Rome, which kind of like I'm split personality now because I come here and I talk about Greece and then I go home and I read about Rome. <laughs> but um, in the Roman Republic, as time went on, we got closer and closer to empire. They massively bribed people to get offices. I mean, bribery was rampant. We, we think, we suspect maybe that our politicians may, you know, sometimes make little deals under the table with people, maybe. But it was just out in the open. It was like, I go outside the city and I set up a table loaded with cash and people just line up and I pay them to vote. Like, I'm not even hiding it. I just pay them to vote for me. And so, but if you choose by lot, that gets rid of that problem. Do you know what I mean? That can't ever happen. There's no, there's no corruption in that way. Okay, just a second. Kyle wanted to say something. Well, everybody in Athens basically got the same education. Okay. So it was Not women. Women didn't vote, and women were not eligible to hold council positions, okay? This was all male citizens of Athens. But, but it is an interesting concept, but not one that we would really be in favor of, I feel like. Let's just throw it open and, like, every, every elected position, like p police chief and, and I, I don't know, what, or lo mayor. We just, just, we just have everybody, you know, draw straws. <laughs> Whoever gets the long straw, you're the mayor. <laughs> Congratulations. Not really. They had those, those factions. But after, after, I mean, the parties always ended up gravitating to, I've got money, I don't have money. I've got influence, I don't have influence, but not views of how the government should be run, like we think of Republicans versus Democrats. No. We, we didn't have that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, although generally, you know, if you use conservative and liberal as conservative meaning you want to maintain what you have and liberal meaning you want to change and forge ahead and be progressive, probably everywhere has had those sorts of people. Do you know what I mean? Or I have perks and I don't want to lose them, so I want to hang on to them and I want everything to stay the way they are, versus I'm Hannah and I have nothing. And <laughs> you know, thank you, Solon, for freeing me from debt, but I still have nothing. And I tend to wish to shake things up a little bit because maybe I'll come out of it better off. Um, so uh, one more thing, because we're looking at this right now. I mentioned uh, Solon up above. Solon was also a bit of a poet. And he wrote, we have a bunch of reflections of, of Solon. And I want to just, this is something Solon himself wrote about Athens. I want, I'd like to read it, because there's a couple of words in here that are not English words. Our city never will perish according to the decree of Zeus or the will of the blessed gods immortal. For such a great spirited guard holds her hands protectingly above it, Pallas Athena, she of the mighty father. Rather, so he says, our town will never perish because the gods have it, gods are in control. Rather, the townsmen themselves in their folly wish to destroy our great city, persuaded by wealth, if Athens ever goes down, says Solomon, it's going to be our own fault. It's not the gods aren't watching over us. And unjust is the mind of the leaders of the demos, the deem. That means the, the I don't even know what the translation is, um, the, the common people and, and 
like our, our, those tribes. Um, but the deem means sort of like the county, the city-state, it means the people. It's where we get democracy, deem. It's the rule of the people, okay? Unjust is the mind of the leaders of the demos. For them, many grievous sufferings are certain, the fruit of their great hubris. Hubris means arrogance, pride. For they do not know how to suppress koros. Koros means greed, insatiable desire for stuff. Yes, yes. Or how to conduct the present joys of their feasting in decorous fashion. They get carried away with their feasting. Yes. But instead they grow rich, putting their trust in unjust deeds. This almost sounds like it could be uh, one of the prophets of the Old Testament saying, the, the people are unjust. They oppress the poor. They feast, and they don't pay attention to what's just, and it's going to come back to bite them. That's what Solon had to say. Um, so let's dive in. Oh, we've got some art of the week, and then we're going to start just, we're going to see how far we get into Herodotus. We are obviously, I hope this is obvious to you, we're not going to be discussing every single story in Herodotus and every single thing he says because we can't. But I would like to guide you through it and highlight some things that I think are most important. But first, I would like to show you a couple of pictures. I'm trying to decide if I will be able to bend over. I may have to have somebody, and I'm going to throw this at the table on the floor. No, later, I'm going to want it. Okay. So. At the, oh, what have I lost? One of my little clips. Okay, so um, actually I'm going to hold on to, how do I, okay, just a second. I need to figure out how to put this together. Um, hold on to that. We're going to, when we get to the place, oh no, I'm going to do it because I'm holding it in my hand and I, after I lean over. Um, the very first story, actually we're going to get up and look at the map. Did everybody get book one read? Did everybody at least start book two? Hopefully. Um, I give you permission to do some skimming on book two if you need to. Because book two is basically the history and geography of Egypt. I would love for you to read it because it's got some cool stuff in there, but it's probably the least important book in the book. <laughs> you know what I mean? Okay, in, in the history. Because it really doesn't have anything to do with the plot. There is a plot. Let me go over the plot. So, the plot is, once upon a time, once upon a time, Asia attacked Europe. We have a dividing line like here. When you cross the Hellespont here, Asia attacked Europe. And then Herodotus goes back and he says, let me tell you how Every time I decide to do, okay, I'm going to repeat myself, but it's okay. Let me tell you how this started. And then there's that beginning section where he says, all the women that got stolen. Okay, probably you read so much stuff, you're like, yeah, I don't remember anything about women being stolen. Okay. Like, they, they stole Europa, and they stole Io, and they stole Helen, and it goes back and forth. But he, then he skips over that, but then he says, the first real time that an Asian oppressed a European was a king named Croesus. Croesus. And Croesus was a ruler in Lydia. And I know you guys, since you have those awesome books with all the maps, you see this. O E S U S. He doesn't die. I mean, he dies eventually. But yes, no, yes. I know he makes it. Croesus was in Lydia, and do you remember? We just talked a couple weeks ago that the cities along the coast here were Greek colonies. Sardis and Miletus. These cities they keep talking about, and 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 on the islands here, they were Greek. They were Greek. So in Herodotus's mind, 
when Croesus is in charge in Lydia and he starts taking over these Greek colonies and Asian is oppressing Europeans. Does that make sense? Because Croesus is a ruler in Asia, but these are Greek cities. They're European cities, even though they're in Asia Minor, and they're filled with Greeks. And that's when it started. So we get this very long, very long section about Croesus's great grandpa. Okay, and then we so, but, but I'm going to pick that up. But I want to show you some pictures. One thing we hear a lot about, especially in sort of Croesus, he keeps going back and forth to Delphi to the oracle, okay, which is just right around the corner here. And I have some pictures because I got to go there. And this is actually a view, um, I can bring them around. Uh, this is what's left of the Temple of Apollo. See these columns here? And this is the foundation of the temple. Um, and um, it, look at the view. Oh my goodness, I have no, I went there like, Oh, this is so pretty. But what you do at Delphi is, so you, you come up, it's obviously you've done some climbing um, by the time you get there. But I brought my little picture book. Um, so, really? Okay. Um, did I not put it in here? I brought this book and I didn't even, oh, well, I'll lay this out later, I can show you. Um, you. You wind up the hill, it's one of these, you're on the side of a mountain and the path goes like this. Do you know what I mean? Because if it was straight up, he'd kill you. And uh, so you go back and forth and each path has stuff on it. So you go up and you go past the, the, the temple and then you go around and there's a building which I thought was in that book and it's the treasury of the Athenians. It talked in the in Herodotus, it talks about, and he put it in the treasury of the Corinthians or the treasury, whatever. So when something, when you consult the oracle and then something good happens, you give it a present. So Croesus was giving all sorts of golden bowls and tripods and things. He was sending it to the oracle because they said, if you attack Persia, a mighty empire will fall. And he's like, without asking which empire, he's like, yeah, let's do it. And I'm gonna send presents. And they had buildings. They look like little temples constructed that they put the gifts in from various cities. And the temple and the treasury of the Athenians is still there. It's still standing. What were you gonna say? I am um, here on page 11. Yes. And he was just oh. given away. It is so oh, yes. No, it, it's, it's enormous, enormous amounts. So the attic talent, 57 pounds. I mean, if you gave a bowl of one talent, a 57 pounds solid gold bowl, are you kidding me? Where did they What page is that on? Uh, that was on page 11, the very first footnote. The Attic Talent had a weight of approximately 57 pounds. The, um, uh, they pronounce that word Egneton now, but I don't know. I think it's Egneton, I don't know, um, of about 82 pounds. We are not sure which one Haraj has refers to here. Seriously, yes. Um, so I marked, just a second, I've got to go back to my, I've got all sorts of notes here. Um, it says, that he left an offering. Oh, I'm pretty sure I marked it. Okay, just a second, because I wanna, I really wanna find it. Let's see if it's in the, okay, it's not under that. Okay, I, I will probably find it when we sit down, so I'm not going to waste our time. Um, it, it said he offered another offering to the temple of Athena Pronea. And so, um, on the bus trip, so you're going up the highway, and you're going towards Delphi, and off, you're, you're, I don't know, not even a mile away, all right, from the temple. 
there's off to the left side of the road, kind of down the hill, there's another temple, and it is, uh, this, this is what's left of it, um, these three uh, circular, part of it was circular, um, and it was a temple to Athena, so it was on the route that people from Athens would pass when they were going to Delphi. So you'd stop first, so I'm going to Delphi, all right, I'm from Athens, I'm going to Delphi, going to consult the oracle. First I stop in here and give offerings to Athena here. And then I pass by a spring, it's called the Castalian Spring, and um, I purify myself, you know, I bathe and I wash my hands and everything. And you can still, the Castalian Spring isn't springing anymore, but it's still the pit is there. And then you go address yourself to the, um, the oracle. Um, then if you want to, you can follow up the path and you can visit the different treasuries. At the very top, I, you're not gonna be able to see this, there's a, um, there's a theater, there's an actual theater built into the hill, and at the very, very top, there's a race course, like a running course, because they had, a, they had sporting events there. They had the Delphic Games, and they would hold them up there. So anyway, I just thought I'd bring, I will lay these out if you want to look at them later. Um, this is kind of cool. I, I, when I read this now, I have a picture in my mind of what we're looking at. So let's, let's go through our questions, okay? On page 35, the first thing I asked you is what does Herodotus say is his purpose in writing this book? Why is he writing it, Alex? So, that we are so we won't forget. You know, we talk about this, we, we have a political climate, I try not to be very political in here and talk about stuff like this, but you're probably aware that we have a climate where a lot of people are not fond of certain historical things and they want to tweak it or change it or, or remove it. <laughs> but, um, and, then, and then here's one that's not controversial at all. Um, it's not American, but remembering the Holocaust. All right? Um, people, you know, they leave those concentration camps in Europe for people to visit for a reason, right? Do not forget. Um, so we put up monuments to things because we don't want to forget. Not always, but often that's the reason for it. Uh, or, or we leave things intact because we don't want to forget either something that re really good that happened and we want to celebrate it and remember to be like that or something bad that happened because we don't want it to happen again, right? Yeah, Alex. Um, not a month ago, uh, was it in Virginia? I don't know. But um, the Robert E. Lee statue was taken down because yes. residents said it was a reminder of slavery. BLM. And it's just a reminder of history. BLM, that's what it was. Yeah. BLM. And of, of a man who freed all his slaves. He seemed like a good man. I mean, Robert E. Lee was a very good man. He didn't even support slavery. He just supported... Virginia. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're, I'm not going to, because I don't want to preach at you guys, and also we don't have time, but, but yes, I agree. So here's what Herodotus says. Herodotus of Halicarnassus here presents his research. His word there is historia, his inquiry. So that human events do not fade with time. May the great and wonderful deeds, some brought forth by the Hellenes, others by the barbarians, not go unsung, as well as the causes that led them to make war on each other. Never forget. Now, Herodotus is not trying to be insulting when he uses the term barbarians. The world was divided into two, yeah. Not Greek. It's like Jew and Gentile, all right? Um, it, it, it's just, the world is divided into two as far as the Greeks are concerned. You're Greek or you're not Greek. And if you're not Greek, you're a barbarian. Yes. And they can, yes. And they, they weren't even necessarily uneducated. They just considered themselves the height, the height of that education, the height of culture, the Greek language, the height of human language. And, and, and the others weren't. They say that the reason they, that they call them barbarians was because they thought when they spoke, they just made a sound that was like bar, 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 bar. That's what it sounded like to them. 
I don't, I hear, I've read this many times. I'm not totally sure that it's true. But, you know, so I, you guys know I'm working on my Greek, and so they, in the context, like, he's going to call the Persians barbarians, the barbarians, in their war against the barbarians. But the Persians weren't necessarily barbaric. Do you know what I mean? Like, the merry-go-round of death. Um, that we're going to talk about later. Um, so I guess I already answered this. Let me, okay, I'm just going to, if you guys don't mind um, me just sort of, browsing through. Um, I, I, I want to read what he, he says about Homer. Um, he talks about Helen, and he says, these are the stories told by the Persians and Phoenicians about uh, Io and Europa and Helen and all of this. I myself have no intention of affirming that these events occurred thus or otherwise. But I do know who was the first man to begin unjust acts against the Hellenes. So he says, you know all that stuff about Europa and Io? I will neither confirm nor deny it. It's just not something I have information about. I'm just telling you what they say. But now I'm going to tell you what I know. And but pay attention when Herodotus says that. He's got a habit of saying, I don't know, that's just what they say, especially in the Egypt book, book two. Like, yeah, that's what the priests told me in Egypt. I can neither confirm or deny this, but this is what they told me. And, and so he's upfront about it. I like that. I like that it, it, since he's our, his first historian, he's our father of history, to be upfront and say, I heard this. I, I don't know if it's true. This is what they told me, but I didn't actually. Sometimes he'll say, I saw this with my own eyes. And then sometimes he'll say, yeah, that's what they told me. I didn't see it. Yeah, Carson. Yeah, that's, that's, that's closer to correct. Yeah, but yeah, that is funny. Again, the one that I consider the least sensible is. Um, I want to read just something else he says right after that comment. I shall describe uh, him, the person who first oppressed the Hellenes, Croesus. Uh, then proceed with the rest of my story, recounting cities both lesser and greater. Listen to this. Since many of those that were great long ago have become inferior, and some that are great in my own time were inferior before. Herodotus says, you know what I've discovered in my travels and my researches? The great don't always stay great. A city that's great today maybe was nothing long ago. Maybe someday it will be nothing again right? That there's an ebb and a flow in human events. And, but any given time, if you live in a great city or a great country, you're like, well, it's always going to be this way. It's always been this way. It's always going to be this way. We're always going to be rich and powerful. And Herodotus says, no, we're not. Not necessarily. So I, like I said, I already answered question two. For what event do the Persians Blame, oh, no, I, I alluded to it. For what event do the Persians blame the Hellenes for hostilities between the two people? What did you guys put for that question? The kidnapping of women, in particular, the kidnapping of Helen. Carson. Yes, I love this comment. Um, this is what it says in your translation. It is the way of sensible people to have no concern for abducted women. It is quite obvious that the women would not have been abducted if they had not been compliant. <laughs> Obviously, they went. Uh, okay, here's the other. I have another translation that sometimes phrases things funny. Here's what it says. Now, as for the carrying off of women, it is the deed, they say, of a rogue. But to make a stir about such as are carried off argues a man a fool. <laughs> Like, who would, who would care about abducted women? 
they wanted to go. They obviously wanted to go. Um, yes. Okay. So then we go to Croesus, um, and we have the story of Croesus, and we we go back in time because. And let me show you why we're going back in time. I'm okay. I'm going to have to just tell you some things. You're going to have to trust me because if I go back and forth, it's going to be half our time if I try to find stuff in here. We hear the story of um, uh, Candules and Gyges. Candules is the guy who thinks his wife is so pretty that everybody should see her naked. Oh my goodness, that was such a bad story. All right, this is actually, uh, the, my, my son, the one who called it the merry-go-round of death, still quotes this, um, and, he, and it says um, about this, that he fell in love, or this Candules fell in love with his own wife. And being in love, thought he had the most beautiful of all women. And it says in my other translation, this fancy had strange consequences. <laughs> my son often quotes that. This fancy had strange consequences. Um, so he, he tricks this guy into seeing her naked, and then she knows it. And she's like, now you've got to murder my husband because you... So anyway, the guy G's is Croesus's great-grandpa because he, he got to be king, but he was cursed that he would only have four generations of rulers because he took the rule by murdering his former master, right? That's why Herodotus is telling us this, because Croesus is the fourth generation. They run out their, their, their generations. Um, so the story says, this is our friend Solon. Solon, when he um, redid Athens laws, People kept, uh, Solon, why'd you make this law? Solon, don't you think you should change that? Solon, and finally Solon said, you know, I'm going to go on a little vacation, and I'm going to be gone 10 years. And I, you've got to promise not to change anything for 10 years. Let, it, let the new law system sort of run for a while. And then I'll come back and we'll see how it's going. And then, if you want to knock, and you know, we'll talk about it. So he traveled all around, and one of the places they say he went was Lydia, and he visited Croesus. Do you remember, I asked you, what lesson did Solon try to teach Croesus? Lay it on me, Carson. Yes. Um, do you want to be more specific, Alex? Tell me the story. I don't disagree with that, yes. Don't look for happiness until you know the end of the story, right? Happiness is fickle. So Croesus shows him all his stuff. And if this guy is making 57, 82-pound bowls to send to Delphi, some cash, some serious cash. And see all my stuff, Solon? Isn't it awesome? So. Have you ever seen anyone happier than me? Yes. Yeah. There's this, there's this, these two brothers, and once upon a time, their mom was a priestess, and the oxen were sick or whatever, and so they, they took her in a cart to the festival, and because they're such good sons, and they were awesome, and their mom prayed to the goddess, oh, give my sons a wonderful reward. And so they just died. They just died peacefully right then while they were at the top of their fame and nothing bad could happen. And so you're Croesus and you're listening to this story. Well, is there anybody else? Uh, actually, that might have been the second one. I think the, fir uh, the first one was, oh, there's this guy, and he was, he was a really good guy, and he, he had a nice family, and he went out to fight for his country, and he died nobly on the battlefield. <laughs> and Croesus finally loses it. So, when you're a jerk. <laughs> Newsflash, look around you. Have you not noticed my kingdom? So I was like, ah. But you never know what's going to happen in the future. And you're doing well right now, but you never, ever know what might 
happen. I, it's got to be one of my blue flags. Wouldn't you think I would flag that? Um, oh, I'm never going to. Okay, I'm, we're just going to. I'm just going to finish the story. I'm not going to try to find it because I don't want to lose this story. Um, so, fast forwarding. Croesus, after consulting the oracle, who said, yes, if you attack the Persians, a mighty empire will fall. <laughs> Yay, let's, let's do it. I think he attacks, he attacks, and Cyrus the Persian comes back and says, uh, no. no, you're not going to do that. Has him on a pyre to burn him alive with like sacrifices down below. And he's, he hears him, oh, Solon, oh, Solon. And Cyrus like, what is he talking about? Would you go ask him what he's talking about? Like, oh, Solon. <clears throat> <laughs> they get him off the pyre. Like, it's already lit. They have some trouble, like, getting him because it's the pyre, you know? Tell me about Solon. He tells the story. Now I know that Solon was the wisest man I ever met because I was once on the top of the world, and now I'm a prisoner. Cyrus loved this story. Loved it so much, as Ethan pointed out, didn't execute him. In fact, made him his advisor, and, and Croesus just went traveling around with the Persian king. Even after Cyrus dies, his son Cambyses, he, he, he goes around with him. Awesome. I feel like there's a lesson there. If you're ever about to be executed, just call out Solon's name, and no, that is not, that's probably not going to work. A, don't do anything to cause you to get executed. But um, so in, um, I'm in book one, uh, paragraph 59. In your, in your uh, version, it's, it's page 33. Um, he goes back and he talks about Pisistratus, the guy we just talked about. That, because now, here's, here's Herodotus' mind. There's, there's Asia versus Europe. How did this start? We stole women. How did it really start? Croesus attacked, attacked Greek cities. Well, who is this Croesus guy? Well, his great grandpa is the guy who saw the lady naked and then had to kill his master. Okay, and then he tells a bunch of stories about their family, and we get down to Croesus. And then he's going to switch over and he's going to tell you about Cyrus's upbringing and backstory. Um, but in the meantime, he talks about the fact I'm doing this, but I have a map, right? this. You guys went to the trouble of hanging this map for me. So he points out that um, the, when Croesus was taking over here, and especially and after Cyrus took over these cities that were Greek colonies, they went over to Athens and Sparta. And they said, will, will you help us? We help. We're Greek. We're Greek. We need help. And the Persians, uh, the Lydians, Croesus, these people are oppressing us. Will you come help your fellow Greeks? Which makes uh, Herodotus take another digression to tell us all about Athens. He says, well then, of these two peoples, Croesus learned that those in Attica, that's Athens, were currently being oppressed and divided in political strife by Pisistratus, son of Hippocrates, who was ruling Athens as a tyrant at the time. Long before this, the tyrant's father Hippocrates had received a great portent when he attended the Olympic Games, in no official capacity, but merely as a spectator. When he had sacrificed the victims, the cauldrons, which had been set in place and filled with the meat and water, boiled and overflowed, although the fire had not been lit. When your water boils before you light a fire, this is always interesting. Um, Chilon, oh, I need to mention this. The Lacedaemonian, that means Spartan. I don't, you know, okay, did I tell you that? That's the Spartans. Oh, could, could it possibly be named after Leo uh, No, it's, it's uh, I don't, I think it's named after one of their kings, but that's what they called themselves. 
They called Sparta Lacedaemon or Lacedaemon. I wish I had mentioned that, but hopefully, but those of you who had me last year remembered, hopefully. Um, he advised Hippocrates to avoid bringing into his household a childbearing wife. You don't want to have a kid. It's not a good idea, but he had Pisistratus anyway. Okay. So then it says, listen to this. At Athens, two factions formed, one of the coastal district, under the leadership of Megacles, son of Alcmeon, another of the plains district under Lycorgus, son of um, Aristolides. All right, there's our factions, right? And it goes on, I'm not going to read this whole thing, but Pisistratus uh, decided to get one of these factions on his side. He's so funny, though, i got to read this story. Um, first, this is Pisistratus, he wounded himself and his mules and drove his chariot into the center of town, claiming to be in flight from enemies who had attempted to kill him as he drove in the countryside. But he did it to himself. He then asked the Athenian people to grant him protection, reminding him them of his many past achievements on their behalf, particularly his service as general in the war against Megara. The Athenian people, completely duped by Pisistratus, selected some of the, their city's men to serve as a bodyguard for him. He wounds himself. He says, oh, I need protection, and he gets a bodyguard. Oh, he's good. These men carried wooden clubs instead of spears and followed him about, and they supported him when he revolted and took control of the Acropolis. From then on, Pisistratus ruled the Athenians, but he neither disrupted the existing political offices nor changed the laws. He's not a bad guy. Um, but um, if you turn the page to page 35, uh, after a while, the partisans of these factions threw him out. But he comes back, and it says, um, this is sentence three in that first paragraph. Pisistratus agreed to the terms and accepted the offer. They want to bring him back. They then, in order to help him return to power, contrived the silliest scheme I've ever heard of. Particularly silly in this case, for long ago the Hellenes distinguished themselves from barbarians by their superior cleverness and freedom from naive stupidity. Moreover, they carried out this scheme against the Athenians, who were at the time reputed to surpass all other Hellenes in intellect. Here's what he did. There was a woman named Phaya in the deem of Paeania, who was almost six feet tall and strikingly beautiful. They dressed her up in a full set of armor, placed her in a chariot, showed her how to project a distinguished appearance, and they drove her into the city. They sent heralds on ahead of them to tell the people to remain in the city and to proclaim, Athenians, hail Pisistratus and welcome him joyfully, since Athena herself is bringing him home to her own Acropolis, honoring him above all men. They got some tall, beautiful woman to pretend to be Athena. In the city, people actually worshipped this woman in the belief that she was really the goddess, and they welcomed Pisistratus back. Um, they got rid of him again, and he came back again. Did this four times. Um, he really wants to move. Yes, he does. So, and then, so we go through all that, and in paragraph 65, and so Croesus learned that the Athenians were being oppressed in this way at the time. Now we're back to the story. What was the story? Ugh. The cities on, in Asia Minor sent messengers to Athens, will you help us? And Athens says, no, we're dealing with Pisistratus and all his crud. Was it the Spartans who said that? No, the Athenians said that. So then they go to Sparta, and now he gives us the backstory of Sparta. Um, about a man named Lycurgus. We're going to talk about him a little next week, okay? And we're going to read actually a whole biography of Lycurgus. He's the one who turned them into a military state. Um, I'm going to skip over that because it's just not important, okay? Um, so skipping up, Cyrus um, conquers Croesus, all right? Oh, there it was. Um, Croesus was really ticked off with the oracle. He sent, I love this, 
Croesus was able to send some Lydians to Delphi with orders to place shackles at the temple's threshold and ask the god if he was not at all ashamed that his oracle had encouraged Croesus to make war on the Persians with the goal of ending Cyrus's power, from which venture, however, the only victory offerings Croesus could dedicate were these shackles. This is what I got from that war, shackles. Aren't you ashamed of yourself, Apollo? And he instructed them, as they said these words, to point to the shackles and ask if the Hellenic gods were habitually ungrateful. When the Lydians arrived and carried out their orders, the Pythia, who is the priestess who gives the message, is said to have replied, fated destiny is impossible to avoid even for a god. Croesus had to atone for the wrong of his ancestor four generations ago. This ancestor was a bodyguard for his king of the family line of the Heraclids. In other words, they were descendants of Heracles. He was induced by a trick involving a woman to kill his master and usurp for himself a position that did not belong to him. And Croesus has to atone for it. Um, I guess we already answered what motivates Croesus to attack the Persians. Um, greed, power, and the oracle, to sum it up. Um, and I guess we already answered how did the Delphic oral girl mislead Croesus by an ambiguous answer. A mighty empire will fall. And I, also, I guess I answered this too. What reason does the oracle eventually give for misleading him? Right here. The bill came due. Four generations ago, your ancestor murdered the king and took over. You owe. The bill has now come due for Croesus. Oh, I already answered this one too. I'm so sorry. By what trick did Pisistratus become a tyrant of Athens? All right, by the wounding himself and getting a bodyguard, right? And then the third time by dressing up an Athena lady. Well, I love Herodotus. It's the silliest trick I ever heard. What? Athens, we're supposed to be smart. Like, how are they stupid enough to fall for that trick? Um, so, uh, oh, and I found it. I found my Athena Pronea. I'm sorry. Um, that is the story of the empire of Croesus and the first conquest of Ionia. Um, and then he goes on all the things he dedicated, golden cows and many columns at Ephesus, a large golden shield in the temple of Athena Pronea at Delphi. That's my picture with the circular columns. These still exist in my time, but some of his other gifts have been lost. Herodotus went to see them. Okay, then we start talking about the Medes and the Persians. If you have read the book of Daniel, um, you know, this is why Daniel could not get out of the whole lion's den thing. It's a law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be changed. In Esther, you know, they've, they've decided to kill all the Jews on a certain day. It's the law of the Medes and the Persians which cannot be changed. They could give the Jews the right to defend themselves, which is what they did. So, the Medes and the Persians. <clears throat> They, all get, they get lumped together in the Bible, in, in Esther and in Daniel. There are two groups of people. And uh, you've got your wonderful maps in your books. But, you know, the Medes were more northern, and the Persians were a southern group. And the Medes, eventually, we, the Persians tend to be more famous, you know, because they're just Persia. But who you say the Medes, and people are like, what you're talking about. If you say the Persians, people are like, yeah, I know the Persians. Um, but the Medes were the more powerful of the two. And we read this long story about Cyrus. And I asked you, how does Cyrus's birth and infancy sound similar to mythological stories, Alex? And what happened to Cyrus that was familiar like that? Um, he was left for dead. He was, he was another baby abandoned. 
picked up by a shepherd or a servant of the king and raised in secret. Just to jog your memory, in this case, he went home and his wife had given birth to a stillborn, to a dead baby. The baby died in birth, or the baby had already died anyway. She had a dead baby and a live baby, and they're like, well, we'll lay the dead baby out and we'll raise this baby, who turned out to be Cyrus, who was supposed to not survive. Also Romulus and Remus. And also Romulus and Remus. We have all these, these children, and Moses. Did you say Moses, too, yes. was one of them? So said, and I'm not, by that, I'm not implying I don't believe that really happened to Moses. I'm not implying I don't believe it's historically accurate, but it is, it's, it's legendary in a sense of, it sounds like a legendary story. It's, it's got that ring to it. I don't know that this didn't happen to Cyrus, but it's got that ring to it. So Herodotus is already setting us up for Cyrus being like, like a hero. Yes, I was going to say superhuman, but... Yes, yes. Just because something comes in a lot of stories doesn't mean it doesn't historically happen. But it relates all these to each other, that this, they become part of this larger-than-life story, this thing that plays out over and over again. So um, why did Harpagos turn against the Medes? He was a Mede, but Cyrus was half Persian. All right. Do you remember the story that um, the king of the Medes married his daughter off to a Persian because there had been, he had a dream and he was afraid his daughter was going to give birth to someone who was going to like basically take over the whole world. Well, if I marry her to a nobody, it won't happen. What made Harpagos turn against the Medes and send that message to Cyrus saying, you can take them, you can take them out. You guys remember? This also sounds like other stories that we've been reading. He wants revenge. Do you remember why, Hannah? He fed him his son, which is gross. So Harpagos was the guy in charge of killing Cyrus, and he didn't do it. Now, it wasn't even his fault. They took his messengers. Okay, actually, it was his fault because he was supposed to do it himself, but he handed it off to somebody else to do it. It's the moral of the story, if someone ever gives you a baby and tells you to kill it, just never, ever do that. It's <laughs> <I'm just laughs> hard to find a moral to some of these stories. No, he, he, he gave it to someone else who saved it and showed them, a, but he showed a body. They had no reason to believe it wasn't the body of Cyrus, but it just happened to be this forester, shepherd, whoever it was, his dead child. But finally, when the truth came out, yeah, the king's all smiles. Oh, it's okay, Harpagos, you want to come to dinner? Oh, why don't you send your son a little bit before? I'm going to, I'm going to, I got some business with your son. Fed him his son, which sounds a lot like Agamemnon and and um, Menelaus' dad, right? Atreus and Thyestes and that whole curse. We're going to go back and talk about that again after we're done with Herodotus. I know, I'm sorry, but we are. Um, and so, but he, the, the amazing thing is he just sat on that for years. All the time Cyrus is growing up, this happened, and he's just like, oh, my day will come. S someday. Someday. And Cyrus was grown, he was popular, he was uh, a, a good general, a good soldier, good militarily. And Herpagos is like, my moment has come. Cyrus, come back here, get rid of the king. You can have it all. And Cyrus takes the bait. Um, Cyrus comes back, he, he, he conquers um, the... Uh, Persians kills his grand is his grandpa. But his grandpa did have to try to have him killed as an infant. So I shouldn't try to make excuses for any of these people, should I? Um, and then he goes to Babylon. I'm looking in my 
Um, oh, he goes through a, a lot of Persian customs. I just have to read this because I put a little smiley face by it. I'm reading this for no reason except that I like it. They eat few main dishes, but consume many desserts. And the latter are not served as one course, but at intervals throughout the meal. I feel like we should do this. Few main dishes, but many desserts served at intervals throughout the meal. That's all I have to say about that. That's not, not, nothing else. Um, oh, but I got to tell you one more Persian custom. They are accustomed to deliberating on the most serious business while they are drunk. And whatever decision they reach in these sessions, it is proposed to them again the next day by the host in whose house they had deliberated the night before. If the decision still pleases them when they are sober, they act on it. If not, they give it up. Conversely, whatever provisional decisions they consider while sober, they reconsider when they are drunk. <laughs> Maybe, but I feel like if you're going to deliberate while you're drunk, maybe you should also make the rules changeable. Um, I, mean, I guess they wanted two perspectives on it somehow for some reason. You know, they really want to increase the pressure. That this is your final decision. Are you sure? Um, do you guys recall how Cyrus, because the next thing he wants to do is take the, the capital of um, of the Persians, which used to be the capital of, well, it's going to be the capital of the Persians. It was the capital of the Babylonians. Do you remember what he did? I didn't ask you. How does Cyrus get inside Babylon? Babylon had had a queen, and she had done this, like, not very long before to do some work inside Babylon. I'll give you a hint. Babylon has a river that runs right through it. So they have a wall. Yes. The wall has a gap in it so like the rivers come through and they can close off that gap but they need to because everyone's hiding from the sea. So they're like, hey, let's just all sneaky go in through the river and so they did this thing. And do you remember, but the river was a little too deep. So, we so they did what? Oh. oh. They diverted the flow of the river to, to make the river level go down so they could come in. This, and it says, um, Herodotus tells us that Babylon was so big that certain parts of the city didn't even find out for several days that they'd been overrun. I'm just to remind you, I have your little Herodotus in the Bible chart. This is, and it says they were feasting. It was a big feast time. And all the upper class people and the king inside Babylon were feasting and they were distracted. Hold on. It's the night of the handwriting on the wall. Uh, right. You're going to get overtaken. Yes. Nice. Yes. This is the other side. This is what Cyrus diverted the river channel, sent his soldiers in, while Belshazzar is drinking out of the temple cups and saying, bring those Jerusalem temple cups out. Let's have a drink. Have my martini and my margarita out of those cups. Is that the one with the ghost Yes. You have been weighed in the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. It's Cyrus. Because they're now walking through your river right now. But, but news didn't, you know, because they, they was having this feasting time and, and Babylon was a really large city. And they didn't have, you know, they didn't call your friend on the other side of town. Hey, I see people crawling through the river. <laughs> Maybe we should, you know, grab some swords. Yes, and that's what that queen did a couple of genera a generation before. She diverted the river because people were ticked off. You had to take a ferry across. And so they made a, a walls on both sides, and they could have planks across during the day. So they had a bridge during the day, and they removed it at night so that nobody could, could go across. Yes, 
Like if, if you were invaded, it would, and also it did say, I think Herodotus says it's also to, to crack down on crime or something at night. Um, let's, let's look at this last question. Uh, when Cyrus was angry with the, I'm gonna say Gindes River. I don't know that I necessarily pronounce things correctly. How did he punish it? He split it into like hundreds of little channels and like, guess what? People are just gonna walk over you now. And I asked you, what kind of person does this reveal him to be? Impulsive. Oh, impulsive. He doesn't really think through his feelings. He, yeah, he's, he, he, we're gonna meet other Persian kings that do this sort of thing. Um, so he, he conquers Babylon and then he goes up in the area of the Caspian Sea. All right, so he's, he's taken, here's Babylon, he's taken Asia Minor, and he's, he's moving, because it's just, I don't know what the drive is. We're going to take over more and more and more and more. You recall, it was up here, um, it was actually off the map here on this side, that he's going to meet the, the queen who says, do you want me to come across the river or you come across? And Croesus gave him advice, but Cyrus ended up dying in that battle. And um, his son Cambyses took over. Um, and that takes us to book two, because Cambyses now wants to attack Egypt. Next, next campaign is going to be Egypt. And he's still got Croesus with him, giving him advice. Um, I, gotta, I gotta mention this. Um, I was gonna ask you a question about this, but I decided not to. I, I'll just read this. He's talking about um, some of the habits of the people in the area of the Caspian Sea. This is on page 109. Um, they have also discovered other trees bearing fruit, which they use when they gather together in groups. They sit in a circle around a fire and throw this fruit into it, inhaling the fumes as the fruit burns. They then become intoxicated by the vapors, just as the Hellenes become intoxicated with wine. They add more of the fruit to the fire and become even more intoxicated until they reach a point where they stand up and begin to sing and dance. This then is said to be their way of life. What are they doing? They're getting high. They're getting high. I like, I don't know, he calls it a fruit. I don't know that it's marijuana. I don't know what it is, but there's some sort of plant they're throwing on the fire and they're smoking it. They're smoking it. There's, you know, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun. Okay, there is nothing new under the sun. Um, I just, I had no reason to mention that except that I thought it was funny and interesting. Um, uh, I want to make, let me just go through real quick some of my tabs, things I wanted to mention. Um, Herodotus is one of our main sources when we try to date maybe Homer and Hesiod. Don't forget our friend Hesiod with his works and days. Um, Herodotus says, for I believe that Hesiod and Homer were contemporaries who lived no more than 400 years before my time. So maybe 800 BC. These were the poets who composed for the Hellenes the Theogony, assigned to the gods their epithets, defined their particular honors and skills and described what they look like. Um, he says, that is what I think. And you know, most people today agree with Herodotus. Interestingly, they're like, yeah, we, we think you're probably right. If there was a Homer, he probably lived about 800 BC. Um, so we enter book two, when Cambyses decides to attack Egypt. And most of book two, as I said, is a study of the history, geography, and flora and fauna of Egypt. As Karsten mentioned, speculation on why does the Nile flood. Um, I answered the question in book two, who ruled the Persians after Cyrus died? That would be his son, Cambyses. Um, did anybody get to what time marking scheme did the Egyptians originate? Yeah. 12 month calendar. Um, and uh, flying snakes. Did you get to the flying snakes? Um, so he says, let me see if I can find. Does anybody, do you, did anybody mark? See, I have so many flags. Oh, here, winged serpent. 
There's a place in Arabia somewhat near the city of Buoto, and I went to this site in order to learn about the winged serpents. When I arrived there, I saw the bones and spines of serpents in such huge quantities as to beggar description. The spines lay in heaps. There were quite a few of these heaps, too. Um, and the ibises eat them when they come through this pass. And those of you that were in my junior high last year, I think we talked about this. Did anyone look up Job? Did anyone look that up? What, is it, what does it describe in Job? Yes. So why do you think that the reason I brought this up here is because people often, I guess we need to close it down here soon, people often um, are very skeptical about Herodotus, although they find a lot of, of good in what he says. Yeah, and you know, if you've been looking at the footnotes at all, Sometimes it'll say, yeah, Herodotus way misjudged this distance. Or, you know, this is not, this is not geographically correct. Apparently Herodotus was, was told to him and he didn't see it for himself. But he mentions the phoenix, the bird that brings its father, you know, his father dies, he's born from the ashes. Or he mentions the, and he mentions these winged serpents. Um, why do you think the NIV translators and the King James translators translated that animal differently. What do you think, Kristen? Or, no, go ahead. Because it will make people not believe. But what if they did? We don't know that they didn't. There's all sorts of extinct animals. There's all sorts of animals that lived once and I've never seen, that nobody alive today has ever seen. So for me to sit here and say, Herodotus, even though he says this, the place where the bones lay is at a narrow mountain pass leading onto a vast plain. Um, He says, when I arrived there, I saw. And I'm going to sit here 2,500 years later and say, no, you didn't. Because there's no winged serpents. I don't know what you're thinking about. You know what I mean? He says he saw it, and I have no reason to disagree with Herodotus. It would be, yeah, Matthew. It does, and we can't prove that he didn't. But I guess I just naturally get angry when the assumption is that some person who lived thousands of years ago was an idiot and didn't know what they were talking about and doesn't know what they saw. I mean, Herodotus. has traveled and is well read and has done all this research. Do you know what I mean? But he does mention the phoenix and he does mention the winged serpents. I don't know, I don't know. But um, I would like you to finish book two and read book three. Book three is A, much shorter than book one. And if and it's not like book two. It's, it's more, there's action again. Do you know what I mean? Like people are going to fight with each other and there's going to be wars and it's going to be a little more interesting. Um, if you're not a big fan of why the Nile floods and what a crocodile looks like, although he has hippos having a mane like a horse. That's how he describes hippos. And it really makes me feel like, Herodotus, my dear, did you see a hippo while you were there? Did somebody just tell you? Or does it just have like seaweed on its back? <laughs> I just don't think. So do you know what I mean? Sometimes, so that, that's the dilemma. That's the winged serpent dilemma. Like he's wrong about hippos. We're pretty sure there was never a biological animal that, whose parent lights itself on fire and it rises out of the ashes. It just doesn't seem, just doesn't seem possible. 
so the winged serpents are on the fence. You know what I mean? And we just, we don't know. That's what makes Herodotus kind of interesting. When you got it mixed in with people throwing some sort of plant on a fire and inhaling the fumes <laughs> until they sing and dance. It's like, okay, that's kind of funny. Um, finish your paper if you didn't already. If you did, hurrah for you. Just read Herodotus this week. And have a good week. I will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.